1838, after persecution grew so strong in Kirtland, Ohio, Joseph Smith was warned his life was in danger. So Joseph, his wife Emma, and many other church leaders were compelled to leave the northern Ohio town. Most of the faithful members decided to follow the prophet and had a thousand miles west to western Missouri to try to begin their lives again. The church had been established in Independence where a temple was planned and cornerstones laid. But in 1833, the saints were driven from their homes in Jackson County. So by 1838, settlements in Clay County were developed at Far West and Adam on Diamond. To help the Ohio Saints accomplish the task of migration, companies of about 500 were organized to travel and camp along the way. The Kirtland camp found it difficult, not just because of the rugged terrain, but because of the persecution they encountered along the way. Accidents and illness afflicted these early pioneers. They forded streams, climbed up and down inclines, slept on damp terrain, and were continually weakened by fatigue, a changing diet, and poor drinking water. But most of them pressed on to join the prophet and other church members at Far West. Other saints scattered around the country were also anxious to gather with the church and enjoy a little season of peace after the previous years of turbulence. The people of Clay County, Missouri had originally welcomed the Mormon refugees when they were first driven from their homes in Independence, but now were becoming anxious about the increasing numbers of Mormons who were moving there. About a hundred families had begun settling in the outpost area known as Far West. So church leaders began to explore the surrounding northern Missouri area as possible alternative sites for settlement. While most of the area was prairie, there were some wooded areas suitable for settlement, particularly along the banks of the Shoal Creek, about 12 miles to the east of Far West. Jacob Hahn, an early immigrant, had begun settlement of the Shoal Creek area about a year earlier, creating a mill on the creek side which attracted several families. Joseph and Emma had fled Kirtland because of persecution, not only from intolerant neighbors, but from many church members who had become disenchanted with church leadership. Similar problems had arisen in Missouri because of some of the local church leaders who had made poor judgments involving land sales. That resulted in some members of the stake presidency and even some apostles losing their church membership. Among those losing their membership was church historian John Whitmer, whose home was used to organize the church back in New York, and Book of Mormon witness Oliver Cowdery, who left his calling as assistant president of the church to begin a personal law practice. And David Whitmer, another of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon in New York, was also excommunicated from the church at this time on charges of usurping church authority, among other things. David Whitmer never did return to the church, although he never denied the experiences of seeing the angel Moroni and handling the gold plates of the Book of Mormon, even till his death years later. Joseph hoped to set the church back in order by his presence in Far West. In 1838, he received a revelation regarding the building up of the church there. Section 115 of the Doctrine and Covenants officially designates the name of the church as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That same revelation also commanded the saints to build a temple in Far West. But the First Presidency was told not to incur such great debt on the Far West Temple as had been done in Kirtland. This is the site known as Far West, Missouri. At its height, more than 4,000 people lived here. It was named as a gathering place for the saints who'd been driven from their homes from Independence and other sites. The city was laid out in square blocks with streets, shops, schools. This specific site was set apart as the dedication site for a Far West temple. It was supposed to have happened on April 26th. Brigham Young and other members of the Council of the Twelve rode into this public square here and brought these huge one-ton foundation stones which can still be seen here today. Recognizing the need for expansion, Joseph and other church leaders headed north to explore more settlement areas. In mid-May of 1838, Joseph Smith and other leaders headed northward from far west in an exploration mission. They reached White's Ferry on the Grand River. The prophet directed the laying out of the city at that location and received a revelation from the Lord that this was the site of Adam on Diamond. In 1835, the Lord had previously revealed that three years before Adam died, he'd called his righteous posterity together here in this valley of Adam on Diamond, and there he bestowed upon them his last blessing. This will also be the location of a very special meeting in the last days when the Savior appears to greet a select group of righteous people here as well. 
This area was also a gathering place for many Latter-day Saint immigrants pouring into Adam on Diamond throughout the summer of 1838. They considered themselves greatly blessed to live in a land where Adam had dwelt. Orson Pratt explained Adam on Diamond meant Valley of God, where Adam dwelt, and was in the original language spoken by Adam. This is an area known as Tower Hill, the west end of the Valley of Adam on Diamond. It was here that Joseph began to direct the building of a city. It was here about 10 days, surveying the area, laying out land on both sides of the river and eastward. In this vicinity on this hill, he said there were remains of an old Nephite altar or tower. The remains are no longer available to be seen today. Settlement here proceeded as Latter-day Saint immigrants came in from Ohio and other areas to build log cabins and to prepare for this big city. Settlement wasn't to last very long, however. Persecutions drove them from this area into Nauvoo. Dissenters in the church continued to cause problems, however. In June, Sidney Rigdon had given a sermon suggesting that dissenters were like salt that had lost its savor and should be cast out. The hot summer of 1838 also contributed to the problems. Fights broke out in various settlements as anti-Mormon sentiment began to grow. That and more oratory from Sidney Rigdon fanned the flames of suspicion among the Missourians, setting the stage for even more violent conflict with the saints and the state. Joseph and other church leaders rode around the countryside trying to calm fears and restore peace among the neighbors. By September, Joseph asked General Alexander Donovan of the Missouri State Militia for advice in settling the growing hostilities. He'd been a lawyer for the Saints during the conflict in Jackson County five years before. He advised Joseph Smith to turn himself in to be tried by the citizens of Davies County as a way to quell the mob violence against the Saints. As had been the case earlier in Jackson County, fear of losing political control to the Mormons was a big motivation for the mobs and old settlers. By October, troops began arriving almost daily for anti-Mormon forces. The Saints also began preparing for what they believed would be a coming war. Joseph appealed to the governor for help, but received a reply that the Saints should just fight it out with the mobs. By late October, after suffering many privations from their enemies, a group of militia members entered some Mormon settlements and attacked the Saints. Many church members were called to arms and fought back. Exaggerated accounts of the Battle of Crooked River soon reached Governor Lilburn Boggs in Jefferson City. False reports of wholesale massacre were all Boggs needed to begin an all-out war against the Mormons. Mobs burned homes and crops in every direction. The governor eventually issued what has become known as an extermination order to drive the Mormons from the state for the public good. On Tuesday, October 30th, 2,000 state troops had surrounded Far West, and most were determined to fulfill the governor's order. And a small group of Missourians decided to attack the small settlement at Hans Mill. The survivors hid throughout the evening and into the night up into the hills there, fearing another attack would come. The next day, after no attack materialized, a few of the able-bodied men who were left buried the dead in a dry hole which had been dug here for a well, which can be seen here today. At least 17 people had been killed and 13 others had been wounded in what has become known as the Hans Mill Massacre. The following day, Far West was sieged by the troops. Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, and others were betrayed. They were arrested and taken into custody by the militia. They were secretly tried and ordered to be executed the following day. But General Donovan refused to carry out the execution, calling it cold-blooded murder. Joseph Smith and a few other prisoners were transferred to Richmond, where they were chained together under guard at an old house for more than two weeks during their trial. During those two weeks, the prisoners were abused by the guards. One November night, the brethren had listened for several hours of obscene jests, horrid oaths, terrible blasphemies, and filthy language, as the guards talked about the atrocities they'd inflicted upon the saints. Then after Joseph could stand it no longer, he stood before them and spoke with a voice of thunder. Silence, ye fiends of the infernal pit. In the name of Christ, I rebuke you and command you to be still. I would not live another minute and bear such language. Cease such language or you or I die this instant, he said. He stood in terrible majesty, chained, without a weapon, calm. The guards put their guns down and listened. Joseph Smith and five others were later bound over for further prosecution and placed in the Liberty Jail in Clay County. The Liberty Jail was essentially a dungeon. It was a two-story stone building. 
A hole in the upper floor was the only access to the lower level. Below, a man would have difficulty standing upright. For four dreary and cold winter months, Joseph Smith and five companions were forced to live in filthy conditions. All the while, the saints were being driven from their homes in the state. But this horrible place became a great place of learning for Joseph. In fact, several of the most compassionate and emotional revelations ever received were given to Joseph here. Here Joseph pleaded with the Lord, O God, where art thou, and where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? Later the Lord spoke words of comfort to him, saying, My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high, and thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. By April, a change of venue is ordered by the court for the prisoners, but the guards allowed Joseph and the others to escape into Illinois in the process. And once again, the saints were left homeless and forced to begin anew to build a place of refuge. Many of the saints found some compassion from the generous people of Quincy, Illinois. Homes were opened up to the refugees, and even some jobs were created. Throughout the late winter and spring of 1839, thousands of Latter-day Saint refugees began arriving along the banks of the Mississippi across from Quincy. The river was frozen, and moderating weather caused big ice flows, making crossing very difficult. The saints were almost destitute, without food, many suffering from the cold, rain, and mud. By summer, the saints were directed to begin buying up lands along a bend in the Mississippi River at an area known as Commerce City. Land speculators quickly moved in among the saints, selling the swampy marshland at amazing prices, largely on credit since the members and the church had little money. By July, Joseph sent word to the saints everywhere to begin migrating to this new site, which he named Nauvoo, a Hebrew word meaning beautiful. Land was cleared, swamps were drained, and Nauvoo was literally transformed into a beautiful place as its name signified. The prophet again designated Nauvoo to be laid out in a square grid form as had been done in Far West and Adam on Diamond. An official city charter was finally approved in 1840 after the lobbying efforts of a prominent citizen, John Bennett. Bennett later joined the church and was elected as Nauvoo's first mayor in 1841. While there were some jealousies by surrounding neighbors, for the first time in a decade, the saints felt they had real security and a real chance to have peace. As the church membership grew more stable, so did the church leadership. The 12 apostles were sent out on missions, some to England and others to the Pacific Islands. In January 1841, Joseph received a revelation designating Nauvoo as a cornerstone of Zion. The Lord commanded that here too a temple should be built where he would reveal sacred ordinances for his people. The first homes in Nauvoo were tents and huts, and later wooden houses were constructed. Eventually, as the saints became more prosperous, homes of brick were completed. Joseph and Emma completed the Nauvoo house, a hotel-like building to be used to accommodate visitors who would come to the city to learn about the Mormons. The saints were industrious, and with so many people available, the city quickly grew. There were bakeries and a printing office. A general store was also important. In this store, dry goods, barrels of other commodities, brooms, and other items were made available to the saints as commerce along the river developed. There was even a social hall to provide entertainment for the church members. Eventually, the saints began to prosper here. Individual homes became rather nice as furnishings like this china, tables and chairs, and sundry other items adorned the houses. Hiram Kimball and Sarah Granger Kimball had moved into this little two-story house shortly after 1840. About two years later, she organized a group of women and helped provide them with materials to make shirts for the workmen of the Nauvoo Temple. These women were later to form the core of what became the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, organized by Joseph Smith. But of all the construction and various projects, the most important to the saints was the building of another temple. Work had begun almost immediately after arriving in 1840. Workmen excavated the temple foundation. 
Solid blocks of limestone measuring four to six feet in diameter were cut from a quarry near the river. On April 6, 1841, Joseph Smith presided over the laying of the cornerstones for the temple. Today, you can still see the foundation and cornerstones where the temple once stood. Most of the able-bodied men provided volunteer labor for the building of the temple, often donating one day in 10 as tithing labor. Publishing of the Times and Seasons newspaper became the chief source for news for the people of Nauvoo. And the church continued to grow doctrinally as well. The practice of baptisms for the dead began here after Joseph said the Lord would recognize the ordinance for the departed friends and relatives of the saints. But later the Lord directed that those baptisms should only be done in his holy house. And since the temple was not complete, a baptismal font was constructed. And so the baptisms could be done during construction of the rest of the temple, a cover was built for the baptismal font. Joseph Smith's red brick store here was perhaps one of the most important buildings in the church through the Nauvoo period because in addition to being a general store, it also served as the center of social, economic, political, and religious activities. It was completed in 1841 and opened for business in January of 1842. On the second floor, Joseph maintained an office, which became basically the headquarters of the church. Prior to completion of the temple, the upper floor was also used as an ordinance room, and the first endowments were given there. Church and civic meetings of various kind were held in the store, including a public school. And in 1842, the Relief Society organization was formed here. Emma Smith was its first president. The building was rebuilt by the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1978. Joseph was occasionally called upon to explain the church to outsiders. One such example was in 1842. Chicago newspaper editor John Wentworth had asked Joseph for a sketch of the rise and persecution of the Latter-day Saints. Joseph complied by sending several pages of history of the church's experiences. The letter included 13 statements outlining church beliefs. Wentworth never did publish the story, but the Times and Seasons did eventually print the Wentworth letter, and the 13 statements became widely known as the 13 Articles of Faith. There was no meeting house in Nauvoo large enough to hold all the saints to hear the prophets speak. Often there were 5,000 members of the church who would gather here to hear what he had to say. The temple would only hold about 3,000. So in good weather, they'd often meet here under these trees. This hillside west of the temple was like an amphitheater. Joseph gave nearly 200 discourses here, which later shaped Latter-day Saint understanding of gospel doctrines for years to come. For three years, Joseph Smith of the Saints in Nauvoo lived in relative peace. But the clouds of opposition would soon be growing against them, and some of the darkest times were still ahead. John Bennett, the first mayor of Nauvoo, was one of those who had a helping hand in causing the future strife for the saints. Bennett had quickly gained in popularity when he arrived in Nauvoo because of his flamboyance and energy. In addition to his election as mayor, Bennett functioned as a temporary counselor to Joseph Smith when Sidney Rigdon fell ill. But Bennett apparently had ulterior motives. Bennett was excommunicated from the church for adultery in 1842 after it was learned he had seduced several women into sexual relationships under the guise of practicing plural marriage. He left Nauvoo and eventually began lecturing against Joseph Smith and the saints. In 1841, after being agitated by some Aryan newspapers, Joseph Smith was arrested as a fugitive from Missouri while he was visiting some of the saints in a nearby county. Judge Stephen A. Douglas, who would later run against Lincoln for president, came to the aid of Joseph Smith at that time, helping him avoid a possible lynching by an out-of-hand mob. Since 1844 was a presidential election year, Joseph wrote each of the main candidates to see which one would best help the saints if they were elected president. But none satisfied his desire for redress for the Missouri expulsion and the saints' other injustices. So Joseph Smith formally declared himself as a candidate for the presidency of the United States. Yet despite the public relations efforts of Joseph and the church, false reports continued to be circulated around the state and country about Joseph and the Mormons. By May 1844, the church was embroiled again in a major conflict with their neighbors. That spring, Joseph sensed something terrible was going to happen. Apostle Orson Hyde recounts that Joseph said he didn't know what it was, but he said, quote, the Lord bids me hasten to give you your endowments before the temple is finished. Joseph, in the upper floors of his red brick store, then conducted Apostle Hyde and all the other apostles through every ordinance of the holy priesthood. 
giving them the keys of authority to carry on the work, even if he was killed in the process. In early June 1844, the dissenters published a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor and attempted to rally anti-Mormons against the church in Nauvoo. After that paper was published, fearing mobs would be aroused from the libelous words, the Nauvoo City Council voted to have the paper silenced as a public nuisance, so the paper was destroyed. But the publishers of the paper used the incident to charge the City Council and Joseph Smith with inciting a riot. They demanded Joseph Smith surrender to the law of the county seat in Carthage, 25 miles away. The situation grew so dangerous, Joseph wrote to Illinois Governor Ford to explain the circumstances. Brigham Young and the other members of the Twelve, who were away on missions at the time, were immediately notified of the pending danger. Governor Ford replied to Joseph's plea for help by claiming that he would have the state militia protect him if he surrendered in Carthage. But Joseph didn't believe it. He reasoned that if he and his brother Hiram would just leave Nauvoo, the violence would likely subside and the danger would pass. He was right about not trusting the governor. A posse was sent to arrest Joseph, but he and Hiram had already decided to cross the Mississippi and hide out on the other side. The following day, several of the church leaders came to Joseph Smith and urged him to return, fearing that the posse and mobs would eventually drive the saints from their homes again despite his departure. Joseph replied, if my life is of no value to my friends, it is of none to myself. Joseph and Hiram then returned to Nauvoo to give themselves up the next day. Early Monday morning, June 24th, Joseph, Hiram, John Taylor, several members of the city council all set out on horseback for Carthage. The weather was hot and humid after a night of rain, but the sun was shining as they set out. They said the temple glistened in the morning sun, and the prophet is said to have remarked, this is the loveliest place and the best people under the heavens. Joseph, Hiram, and several of the city council were met in Carthage by members of the state militia who arrested them and took them into voluntary custody. They spent the night at the Hamilton House, which was a hotel just outside of town. The following morning, the governor declared martial law in Nauvoo, ordering troops to take over the public square. Joseph and his companions were brought to the Carthage jail to await a preliminary hearing. They spent the night on the straw here on the main floor cell. As the town grew more hostile, the jail turned out to be about as safe as any place for the prisoners. They were taken upstairs eventually and allowed to stay in this room instead of the jail cell in the next room. The following day, Thursday, June 27th, after some of the guards had relayed threats made by outside townspeople, Joseph again wrote to the governor for help. That morning, while waiting for a reply, Joseph wrote to his wife, Emma. I'm very much resigned to my lot, he said, knowing I am justified and have done the best that I could have done. Soon after that, Joseph's friends, with the exception of Dr. Willard Richards and John Taylor, were forced to leave the jail. The hours dragged on, and the brethren sweltered in the humid afternoon heat. Joseph eventually gave to Hiram a single-shot pistol which had been smuggled to him earlier that morning. Joseph had been given a six-shooter to defend himself. The mood grew increasingly somber. Joseph asked John Taylor to sing a popular song, A Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief. jail was changed. 
the replacement was one of the men who had threatened the prophet earlier in the day. A few minutes after five, about a hundred men then gathered outside who had blackened their faces. They approached the jail, then a scuffle downstairs. Three or four shots rang out, and the mob ran up the stairs. Joseph's brother Hiram rushed to the door to fight off the assailants who were coming up the stairs. As the gunmen poked their guns through the door, John Taylor tried to deflect the muzzles with his cane. A shot blasted through the door. Hiram, who had been pushing against it with his shoulder, was hit on the left side of his face and fell to the floor, saying, Joseph, I am a dead man. Joseph, leaning over his brother, cried, Oh, dear brother Hiram. He then reached around the door and fired six times from his pistol, but only three chambers fired. John Taylor moved to the window, perhaps to draw the fire from Joseph. He was hit by gunfire from outside below. The bullet hit his pocket watch, stopping it at 5.16 p.m., knocking him to the floor. Taylor was also shot again in his wrist, knee, and another shot injured his hip. Joseph, seeing there was no safety in the room, also moved to the window. But instantly, the mob below fired, hitting Joseph at about the same time, shots from the door hit him, sending him to his death through the open window. His last words, O oh Lord my God. Meanwhile upstairs, Dr. Richards, who was the only one to escape unharmed, dragged the injured John Taylor into the next room to hide in the straw in the dark jail cell. After Joseph had fallen to his death out here by the well, the mob quickly rushed down to see if he was dead. Someone then shouted, the Mormons are coming. The mob quickly dispersed, fearing that the Mormons would take retribution. The bodies laid here for a couple of hours and were later taken to the Hamilton Hotel, where they were prepared for burial in hastily constructed boxes. They were then transported back to Nauvoo, about 25 miles down the road. The deaths of the prophet Joseph and his brother Hiram devastated their families. Joseph and Hiram were buried secretly in the basement of the Nauvoo house, fearing bounty hunters would try to desecrate the remains. John Taylor would later write that Joseph Smith, the prophet, had done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man who ever lived in it. In his short 38-year life, Joseph Smith had translated the Book of Mormon, received hundreds of revelations, published many writings in the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price, established the Lord's Church on the Earth, superintended the building of two temples, ran for the presidency of the United States, served as a judge, a mayor, and general of the Nauvoo Legion, possibly one of the most influential Americans of his time. Joseph's journey to Camorra, to the Grove of Trees in New York, to his eventual triumphs in Kirtland, and his journey to Nauvoo had now come to an end. And with his work finished on Earth, it was now left to those who remained behind to build on the principles he had taught them. And it would be Brigham Young and the Twelve who would eventually lead the church to safety and prosperity on their journey to Zion.